Welcome back again, and thank you for participating in Immaculate Conception's Eucharistic Revival Retreat. We hope you've been blessed by the experience in our church and in the realization of the many miracles of Eucharist displayed in the exhibits. Today, the last day of our retreat, we'll begin with a presentation by our returning guest speaker, Eileen Wood, the caretaker of the exhibits. Eileen will speak to us this morning about St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia, a wonderful saint devoted to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Following the presentation, we will begin the celebration of the Holy Mass with Father Jose, Jose Maria Barbin, the vocation directors of the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate in Griswold, Connecticut, along with our pastor, Father Giacomo Capriverdi, who will concelebrate this Mass. Following Mass, we will venerate the relics of St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia and Blessed Carlo Acudos. We thank you all for your participation during this Eucharistic revival, and we do pray that your hearts have grown closer to our Lord Jesus and that you will return to our parish, the Immaculate Conception Church, or to your home parish, feeling renewed in the Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. It's, is, this, is this good now? The volume? We're good? You can, you can, all, you can hear good. Okay. So um, thank you, Carla. It's a pleasure to be back here. And I think a lot of you heard my talk, I guess, two days ago on Thursday, or if not live on the live stream, but just in case somebody's new. So my name is Eileen Wood. I'm from St. William Parish in Tewksbury, which is in, in Massachusetts. It's north of Boston, kind of halfway between Boston and New Hampshire, right next to Lowell. My husband and I have six daughters, three sons-in-law, and ten grandchildren. So um, I, I talked a lot the other night, if you, wanna, if you missed it, you can, I guess, watch the video, about the exhibit and how I got the exhibit, and I'm Blessed Carlo. So today we're having a little different talk. It's on St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia. And I imagine that most of you here already knew who Blessed Carlo was before the talk. You might not have known all the details, may not have seen the exhibit, but you had heard his name. And I'm also going to guess that probably today most of you are like, St. Manuel who? Who is this guy? And I have to say, a year ago, I was in the exact same position. I think it was just about a year ago, I had never heard of him before. I had no idea who St. Manuel was. So I will just share with you first like my journey into meeting St. Manuel and now, you know, talking about his life. So it was about a year ago that these, um, a, an order of sisters in New Hampshire contacted me and said that they would like to borrow the exhibit of Blessed Carlo, the Eucharistic Miracle exhibit, because they were taking it on a tour. They were working under the Bishop of New Hampshire and they were taking a tour throughout the whole state. They wanted it for like 10 days. So as always, that exhibit is booked like pretty much every single weekend at this point. Sometimes even an extra day midweek comes in, right? And wouldn't you know it, the exact time that they wanted it for 10 days was the time that my um, fifth daughter was graduating from college out in Kansas, at Benedictine College. She was, it was her graduation, and then I was going to drive back with her because she had a car and everything. So I needed that whole week off. I wasn't going to do any exhibits. And, of course, you know, God's perfect timing, that's the time that the sisters want to borrow it. I'm like, well, that works, and I'm not using it anyway. So I told the sisters, I'm like, well, you know, I also have a first-class relic of Blessed Carla. Would you like that? And they said, no, that's okay. We don't need the relic. We're getting the ones from the bishop, the, the USCCB, that's touring the country. So I didn't even understand how this was working. I didn't know this was happening. And then they said, we're also getting the one of St. Manuel. And then I was like, who? <laughs> so what apparently has been going on is that the USCCB, in, when they designated these three years of the Eucharistic revival, they requested two relics, um, one of Blessed Carlo and one of St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia. And they requested those two specifically because those are the two um, patron saints that they designated for this three-year revival. So, so many people have heard of Blessed Carlo, but have not heard of the other saint. And so that's why I'm trying to like, 
let people know about him as well. It's because he is the other half of this Eucharistic revival, right? So now I was curious because they said, okay, he's the other, he's the other saint and he's also known as the Bishop of the Abandoned Tabernacle and that just sounded interesting to me. So I stuck getting on the computer like, St. Manuel, Abandoned Tabernacle, like what am I getting? And I found out that he was a bishop in Spain and he had he'd grown up in, in Seville, which immediately caught my attention because my second daughter just spent the last um, four years living in Spain, specifically in Seville. So I'm like, well, that's really cool. And I'm writing to her, Samantha, have you ever heard of this bishop? And I, I don't think she knew it was by name, but when she saw the picture, like there are statues and pictures in the churches of him around, she, she recognized what he looked like. So I was interested, but then, you know, I got busy, I was doing my thing, and and I didn't, nothing more came of it. So come along February, I'm getting ready to go to Spain to visit my daughter. Um, my younger daughter had a school, week, school vacation week in February, and we said, we'll, we're going to go for 10 days, we'll go to Spain and, and visit. So like three days before I went on the trip, the sister in New Hampshire contacts me, and she says, oh, I know you're going to Spain in a couple of days, I just found out today we got approved to get our, our own relic of St. Manuel. Can you go pick it up for us? I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to Seville with and the relics in Madrid. And that's like a six hour difference. So that's like, you know, you're coming to visit Boston. Can you like hop down to Washington, D.C. and pick something up for me? It really wasn't like on my route. I wasn't even passing through Madrid. I was going through like Lisbon to get into Seville because it's so south. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but okay, let's see where the Holy Spirit is going here. And um, I asked my daughter, hey, do you have a friend who's going to Madrid and can come back in the next you know, week <laughs> with this relic? And so she finds somebody, and she starts contacting this sister in Madrid. Her name is Sister Monica. So Sister Monica is a, of the religious order that was founded by St. Manuel, and she was going to produce the relic for us. And I don't know what inspired the, whole, the um, Sister Monica short of the Holy Spirit, because she said, you know, your mother's coming from the United States. She's going to get the relic. Don't worry about having your friend come pick it up. I'm going to go down to Seville, and I'll bring it with me. Like, she's going to make a whole special trip, six hours, one way, to bring me this relic and like, a moment's notice. And I was like, wow, that's really, that's really cool. And then she said, can I meet your mother? And I, I want to take her on a little, you know, sightseeing thing and... and teacher about St. Manuel, so I'm thrilled. I mean, I'm thinking, Sister Monica doesn't even know who I am, right? But I'm thrilled, and I think, and I suspect, I think we're on live stream, I suspect Sister Monica's watching us from Madrid right now, because <laughs> I told her we're doing the talk, and I'm pretty sure she's watching. So shout out to Sister Monica. But, um, so she comes down to Seville, she meets me, she gets a relic, and she says, do you have some time? I'm gonna take you on some of the places of St. Manuel's life. So she took me a day and a half of all these like all the key places. You know, here's where he was born. We go to the house. This is where he was born. And then a few doors down, the family moved here and he grew up in this other house a few doors down, down the street. And then here's where he was baptized. We went in the church. Here's the baptismal font. Here's the, where he went in the seminary. Um, the seminary's gone, but the chapel's still there. Here's the chapel where he would pray. Like we're in the chapel. And um, then she took me something very special. It's um, a town called Palomares del Rio. I'll explain that in a minute. But that's where this, that title, Bishop of the Abandoned Tabernacle, came from. So we went there as well. So Sister Monica spent, oh, and then we went also to where he celebrated his first Mass. Okay? It was a, a Salesian parish. He, his family was very close with the, the priest, you know, priest of St. John Bosco. And um, his mother used to be a cook for the order, and he held, celebrated his first mass there. Although he was a diocesan priest, he did not join that order. I, I don't know why, but he ha always had a very fondness and closeness with them. So we went to the, where he celebrated his first mass, and just it was just so much fun, like living through like his life, like all the, the places that were so important, and even in the cathedral, a painting of, of something that he had done. He used to be a part of a group called the Sixes in English, and they would dance. You know, it was a very a prestigious group for young boys to dance before the, um, and certain, especially Marian feasts. So that's how I first got introduced to St. Manuel. And I'm thinking, like, wow, the Holy Spirit just, I don't know, like, put my seatbelt on and just go along for the ride, because I don't know where this is taking me. And at the end, she gives me not only the relic for the sisters in New Hampshire, but also a first-class relic that I have that we're going to have here today to venerate after, I guess, after Mass. So, um, yeah, it's been a, a 
like a year since I even knew who this person was to like now all of a sudden talking about his life. So let me give you, I just want to put him in some perspective. Oh, and then just to um, close up that trip of how, I don't know what the Holy Spirit was doing. Like I said, I put my seatbelt on. Sister Monica was visiting on Wednesday and Thursday, and then she went back to Madrid. So I'm thinking I'm on vacation again. Well, I always thought I was going on vacation. I didn't think I was going on this pilgrimage, but it was great. So, okay, now I'm back to being on vacation. And so on Friday, my older daughter, the one who lives there, was teaching. She teaches English. And so she was teaching her classes, and my younger daughter and I were just walking around downtown Seville, and like, who do you think we would just happen to run into? Like, Seville's a big city, okay? It's, it's a big city. It's not like we're in downtown little Nowheresville. Downtown Seville. I run into, of all people, the mother of Blessed Carlo. Like, how does that happen, right? <laughs> it's just short of the Holy Spirit. So, and then, so I met her. I hadn't, I hadn't met her before. I just, that was the first time I ever saw her. But I knew what she looked like from her pictures. And so she gave me her... Um, email and her phone number and we've been corresponding and then a couple months she goes come to come visit me in Italy so I did like in May, August I went back to Europe and I visit her in Italy in August and so um, just uh, crazy stuff so who was uh, St. Manuel he was born in a February of uh, so February 25th specifically of 1877 he died on January 4th of 1940 so his feast day is January 4th so 1877 to 1940, that's, you know, relatively recent. I mean, not as recent as Blessed Carlo, but I would venture to guess there may be people here who were born before 1940. Certainly that's like uh, my, pa my parents certainly were. Um, he, was li he lived kind of in the lifetime of my grandparents. So it's still like close enough that you kind of feel a little uh, close connection. Um, no, I mean, Blessed Carlo is really close, but in the, in the order of saints, he's a newer saint. He was, he was canonized in 2016, so he's still one of our newer saints. The comparison to Blessed Carlo is quite different, though. I mean, just to, like, think of how they're different. Blessed Carlo came from a very wealthy, rich family. St. Manuel's family was extremely poor. Blessed Carlo was an only child. St. Manuel had four older siblings. Um, no, actually, he was the, I'm sorry, I want to correct that. He was the fourth of five children. He had... There were three older brothers, uh, himself, and then a younger sister, Antonia, which is the same name as Blessed Carlo's mother. And Antonia um, actually lived with him her whole life. She helped him as being bishop, you know, would stay in his residence and, you know, cook and clean and just take care of all of his affairs as, as a helper. And she helped found the religious orders. Blessed Carlo came from a family that didn't have much faith. And yet, um, and then St. Manuel came from a very faith-filled family. Blessed Carlo um, died as a child. And we don't know what he would have been if he would have been a priest or what when he, when he would you know, grow up, let's say. But he died as a child. And St. Manuel lived to, you know, a fairly, not super old, but a fairly older age and became a bishop. So you look, their lives look like they're so different in so many ways. It's such a contrast. And yet, I mean, it, and partly it's good for us to see we're going to fall on the spectrum somewhere there, right? Somewhere be between being an only child and having siblings. Somewhere between being rich and poor, right? So this says that we can all be saints, because sainthood, it, it crosses all, all these boundaries. But where they, they have their big thing in common is that their deep love for the Eucharist. And this is why the bishops, in their wisdom, have designated the two of them as to be the patron saints for this Eucharistic revival because of their deep love for Christ in the Eucharist. They had... Um, well, let me just tell a little bit more about St. Manuel. He founded... Um, three religious um, orders. Uh, first one was a lay apostolate in 1910, and they're called the Marias de, la, de los Sagrarios, and I'll explain why that was. He's also founded an order of priests in 1918, and they're the um, Eucharistic, the diocesan Eucharistic missionaries, and so they're actually like a diocesan order. They mostly dissolved during the war. There were only two priests left in Ecuador, so I think they're trying to bring that back, but that, that order's not um, really active right now, except for those two. He also found an order of sisters in 1921. They're the um, missionary, let's see, Eucharistic Missionary Sisters of Nazareth. And they are active, and I, I, I've met many of them, and what a wonderful order they are, and that's what Sister Monica's from. They're currently in 100, about 150 sisters in nine different countries, mostly in Spain, throughout Spain, every place where he ever was, where St. Manuel was, was um, located and, and as a priest or bishop. Also, they have a house in Fatima, in Portugal, in, in Italy, in Rome, 
and then in light of South American countries, you know, it's Mexico, Argentina, Ecuador, Cuba, Peru, and Venezuela. So they're active mostly in, in Spanish-speaking countries. Sister Monica and Sister Mary Teresa, who's the, who's the head of the order right now, they were visiting the United States in May, and so you know, they met with different bishops. So we can just pray that maybe there'll be a time in the future. We don't know. We'll see what's up, what, what God desires. There could be a presence in the United States, but there is not one right now. So why the abandoned tabernacle? So this is the first place Sister Monica took me. So St. Manuel was ordained in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1901. Okay? He was born in 1877, ordained in 1901. So he was only 24 years old. He knew he wanted to be a priest as a young child. He always had this deep love for Christ, for the church, for the Eucharist. And he, he, the priest was always on his mind. In fact, he said if he had lived a thousand lives, he would have been a priest a thousand times. There was no question. All right? if, as a young boy, he wanted to work toward that. He was really concerned. His parents were poor. They didn't have money to pay for him to become a priest, although I'm sure they'd be thrilled because they were a faith-filled family. So he even worked out with the, um, with the seminary how to get accepted and how to somehow get scholarships and work for them and pay for it. So he came home one day, he was so excited, and to tell his parents, one, I got accepted, and two, I don't even worry about the money, I have it taken care of. So he gets ordained in um, 1901, he was just 24 years old. Very young, right? About six months later, February of 1902, the bishop tells him, I'm going to send you on a parish mission. So you know how the parish missions work. The visiting priest comes. They spend like three days, you know, preaching every, after every mass in the morning, maybe in the evening. And they might have a talk every evening, you know, on different things, confession, rosary. You know, you have, we have parish missions here. So that's what he was being sent to do. And he went to a town called Palomares del Rio, which is about, in today's transportation, about 20 minutes outside of Seville. When, so when we went there, when I went there back in February, March, I, we took a car, and it was 20 minutes. In 1902, you had to take the riverboat. And after the riverboat, the sacristan met him with a donkey, and then they made it to the town. So it was like an all-day thing. It was a big, a big journey. And so he's excited. Like, he is in this honeymoon part of his priesthood still, He's so excited to be a priest and to share the word of God and to bring souls to Christ. And it's just, he's just loving every minute of it. And he's so excited. This is his first parish mission. And he starts to envision all these great things that are going to happen. And he thinks of himself as a child. When, when he would be a child, like a visiting priest would come and all the children would run to greet the priest. And, you know, it'd be so excited. And everyone in the town would be excited this is happening. People are anticipating it, right? So he's thinking and they're receiving it. This is going to happen to him. And so he starts to talk to the sacristan. He had brought stuff. He would brought little um, holy cards and, and medals and you know, probably rosaries and scapulars. He's going to give gifts out to the, to the people who come. And he's thinking, every night we're going to have, we're going to pray the rosary. We'll have a Eucharistic procession around town. All the families are going to come. So this is in his head, this idyllic little vision. And so he talks to the sacristan as they're, as they're taking the donkey back to town. He says, so, so are the people all excited? I have all these gifts. And the second sin's like, well, I don't know if people are really going to come because, you know, they work really hard in the fields and, you know, and people don't really come to church that much. He's like, well, what about the children? Aren't the children going to greet the visiting priest? And he's like, I have gifts for them. He's like, well, you know, the children, they work, but, you know, the, the parish priest doesn't really like the kids that come to church because they're kind of noisy and disruptive, so he doesn't even want them here. He's like, well, what about the priest? The priest must have some friends, and, and they're going to come. He's like, oh, the priest really doesn't have any friends in town. He lives in another town and just comes from Mass. And, you know, if he goes to somebody's house, it was very, let me back up, it's very political this time. The war, you know, was, um, the politics were just huge. So if he goes to one person's house, well, then that means he's aligned with this political party. But if he goes to this other person's house, then you're going to think he's aligned with that political party. In fact, if he wears, like, a green vestment for Mass, they think you're part of this party, and if he wears a red vestment for mass, they're going to think he's part of this other party. I mean, we're talking the mass vestments. That has to do with, you know, the feast day and the martyrs and the ordinary time. They don't even, they're so poorly catechized, they're thinking it's all political. So he, someone was like, wait a minute, so does, who comes to mass? Doesn't anybody come to mass? He says, well, you know, the priest is at mass, and I think there's a Mr. Valentino. He comes, and if I'm not working, I might come too. So we're down to two, maybe three people, including the priest, 
coming to Mass. It's like, well, the sacraments, doesn't anybody receive the sacraments? Eh, every once in a while somebody gets baptized or gets married. Like, I mean, there's just like nothing going on. And his heart is just sinking. Like, everything he was thinking was not even close. And so they finally get to the town. He's like, oh, my gosh. He's, in his head, he's just thinking, am I trying to find the next donkey out of here? What time is the next riverboat, you know? Like, what? The, the, no one's going to be here. I just got to tell the bishop this place is completely dead. What, why am I here? So he goes into the church. And um, in Europe and a lot of these churches, they have like a, a little side chapel. They call it a sagrario that has the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle. Not like the Adoration Chapel we have here where Jesus is exposed. Just, there's just a tabernacle there. But there might be three or four benches and, and you can sit and pray. And I think in that time period there wasn't as much exposed adoration. So people don't have, I mean, it's nice to have people there, but you don't have to have somebody there in the same way that the exposed, you know, Eucharistic adoration is. So he, go, he goes to the church, he goes in the chapel. I mean, there's just, like, disrepair. And he look, the, there's dust covering all around the chapel. It's just, like, a layer of dust. And the candles are burning and dripping oil. They're on um, the, the altar cloth. This has burn marks on it and, and oil. There was one window. I was in this actual little cigar. There was one window on the, the, the one, one wall goes to the church. The other side looks outside. There's one window. And the window was so covered in cobwebs that it made the room look dark. I mean, like, covered. So this is what he finds. So clearly people aren't all in there praying all the time. But Jesus was in the tabernacle. He established that. So as he's sitting down to pray, just trying to process, like, what is going on? What does this mean? Like, what am I supposed to do here? And he starts to pray, you know, in the back of his mind, it's like, am I looking for my next escape or what's going to happen? He felt Jesus looking at him through the tabernacle and speaking to him, saying, will you also abandon me? So then he thought, yeah, maybe I should just stay. <laughs> we're not escaping. We're going to stay. And I think, and my understanding is it was actually a successful mission. As much as people weren't thinking or he wasn't thinking it was going to work out, it was a successful mission. It was the only time he ever went to that town. So I was in that room where Jesus spoke to him from the tabernacle. The tabernacle has changed now. It's a new one. But in the sacristy was the original. So it was really cool to see that. Like, here's the tabernacle that Christ actually spoke to him from. And it was a defining moment for him. And I don't want to say turning point because it wasn't like he had a conversion. I mean, he was already always, always faithful, deeply um, in love with Christ. But a defining moment in the fact of he understood where Christ was asking him to focus his ministry and focus his life is this idea of Christ abandoned in the tabernacle. I mean, we can't all focus on every aspect of the faith, right? I mean, some people, they focus on pro-life, and some people focus on marriage ministries or elder care, and they're, they're all good things. I mean, this is, you know, St. Paul, we're all part of the same body. We all have different jobs. So he understood now this is his job, this idea of the Eucharist and Christ abandoned in the tabernacle. It's, it's really interesting. The sisters from his order, they have um, a religious medal as part of their you know, uniform. And if you look at the front of the medal, it's, you know, it's like a kind of a square with you know, round, round edges, square thing. So instead, a lot of people would wear a cross. So instead of wearing a cross, they have this medal because on the medal, it shows a cross. But then if you look, it's like a, you know, like a more of a zoomed out version of the cross not just the cross with the shape, at the foot of the cross, who's there? Mary and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and St. John. So there's three Marys and the St. John, which is that order he found. The late, the late order is the Marias de la Sagrario. So the Marias, the Marys, right? And the, and the St. John, right? So three Marys and one St. John, three women and one man, one man. And they're at the foot of the cross. So Jesus, in that depth of agony, dying on the cross, there's at least four people with him, accompanying him. And then you take that medal the sisters wear, and you look to the backside, you turn over, and there is the tabernacle. And there's nobody. It's just, the, it's just the tabernacle, like the abandoned tabernacle. And I would say we could do a little experiment. <clears throat> I haven't done this yet, but I'm thinking of it. Just spend a day and drop by a few churches. Or just as you, maybe as you're going, whatever you do, just drop by a church. And see how oftentimes you can walk in and you're the only one. I mean, obviously not during Mass time. You're the only one. There's nobody in the church. I mean, of course, this parish, we're blessed to have perpetual adoration. And my parish as well. But 
even if there's a church around you, like maybe you can't come here. You know, you work in another town, or you, maybe you're just here for this, for this event, and you live in another town. You can always just stop by the church and pray before the tabernacle. Jesus is still there in the tabernacle. I mean, the adoration is phenomenal. We should have more of that, but find Jesus wherever. So after that experience, that this became a real focus in his life, and he's written many, many books on the Eucharist. He's written, I think, like 40, 50 books, um, many, many of them on the Eucharist. And his writings are so rich and so deep. They're really profound. There's only... The, the, the reason that like none of you guys, or I'm, I'm assuming, and I hadn't had ever heard of him before, it's because like 97% of his writings are still in Spanish, and they haven't been translated to English yet. There's one book downstairs called The Bishop of the Abandoned Tabernacle. That's kind of a hybrid of a little bit of a biography of him. It's got, you know, it talks about him. The author you know, gives some of his life and some of his own writings. So it, she, well, basically what she does is she starts saying, she'll talk about some problem in the world or some, something, and then she'll say, well, let's hear what St. Manuel has to say about it, and then she'll heavily quote from him. So a lot of that contains his writing, but it's also partly her. I know the sisters in Spain have, have, um, are working to get another book translated, or actually the book that a lot of that writing came from, but just his writings, just exactly here's St. Manuel writing, but now in English. So hopefully that will be out in the next few months. I know they were already working on it, um, maybe even by Christmas, I don't know. So that would be, that's one of the two. And the thing with his writings is that they're simple in a certain sense, and yet they're deeply profound, which is kind of a, a mark of like that brilliance or that inspiration of the Holy Spirit that is both simple and, and rich and deep and really causes you to think. Like you'll think of something new. It's like, yeah, I hadn't thought of that before. It makes sense, but I never thought of it before. If any of you studied um, theology of the body, it has kind of a similar effect. You learn the stuff and say, wow, that's amazing. It's true, and I know it's true. I never thought about it before, and it changes the way I look at the world. Same thing with St. Manuel's writings on the Eucharist. And he has, um, there's a, a couple things he talks about. Like, one of them is, is this idea when he heard Jesus speaking to him or, and, like, felt his gaze. He says, well, Jesus is present in the Blessed Sacrament, in the tabernacle, you know, in the host, in the monstrance, body, blood, soul, and divinity, right? We believe that. So if that's true, if that's what we believe, so his body, he's there, so he can see you. He has eyes to see you. He says, look at him. He's looking at you. He's gazing at you. He's got ears, so talk to him. Of course, God knows everything. He knows more about us than we know about us, right? But he still wants to hear from us. He wants us to share our sorrows, our hopes, our dreams, our, our thanksgiving, you know, just to love him, our, our words of praise. So talk to him because he can hear you. He can see you. So interesting. Like, sometimes we don't think of that. We see the host. We're like, well, yeah, God, Jesus is there. And we think of the, maybe the soul and divinity part, but we don't think of the body. The body, but so in his body, he's there. So that way, so he sees us. So it's an interesting thought, right? So just a little bit back to St. Manuel's life. So after that time in Palo Maris, he never went back to that town. That was it. That was so defining in his life and his and just his whole ministry and yet that was the one only time that he was at that town he was then um a, a priest in Huelva and he was in charge of a lot of parishes there he also made probably from the influence of St. John Bosco right he also started a school there for like a thousand very very poor children so he also had that part of his ministry of helping the poor children with the school he founded an order of as I said the order of priests a diocesan priest too in um then he became bishop. He was bishop in um, Malaga, which is a little bit east. It's east of Seville, so it's in the southern region of Spain, if anybody knows their Spanish geography. And while he was there, again, there was a lot of political unrest, and there was, at some point, there was a civil war. I think this was before the civil war, though. I don't, I don't know my Spanish history as well as I probably should. But he asked the um, local police chief to help him protect the churches because a lot of the churches are being vandalized you know and the police chief said oh of course we'll be happy to help you just um, give me a list of names and addresses of all the churches and I'll make sure that we um, protect the churches so St. Manoel wrote out that list and just by accident you know he's a busy man and you, you get to maybe get distracted just by accident he omitted one of the churches and on the night of May 11th 1931 Every single church on that list burned, except for the one he forgot to include. So 
we don't know how much the, um, <laughs> the police were really helping. He then ha- they also burned the bishop's residence with him inside, but he was able to escape unharmed. He had to flee to Gibraltar for a while, and then um, he ended up in Palencia, which is north of Madrid, and he was bishop there. And that's where he remained bishop until he died. Uh, um, he, they have now his bishop's residence in Palencia is a, um, like a museum with a, a lot of his um, you know, history about him. He was sickly his whole life. He probably had some sort of kidney issues. I, I mean, I don't think they, when he died, they didn't do like an autopsy, but he had a lot of lower back pain. They don't know if he had kidney cancer or some of the kidney dysfunction, but um, he couldn't, at times he couldn't lie down, he couldn't sit down. He would kneel beside the bed to write because that was the only place he got any relief of his lower back pain. So he, he had just, he had had some health problems. And so he just died of natural causes. He had asked that he wanted his um, tomb to be right by the altar because he wanted his bones in death to um, still be close to Jesus. Just like the way he was, he'd be writing about Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament in life, but in death he would be, he still wanted his bones to be close to Jesus. His bishop's motto was, look for he who consoles you. And his and we ask, he encourages people always to just recognize Jesus in the, in the true presence, in the, in the tabernacle, or in the monstrance, and go to visit him, you know, frequently. He talks about, again, this is like from his writings, he talks about abandonment, and he talks about external abandonment and internal abandonment. Now, Simon Wall's writings are really for a, a different type of person than Blessed Carlos would be for. And I really see the brilliance of why the bishops in the U.S. picked these two saints and, and how they're different. So I don't pretend to know the mind of God and everything, but I, this one area I think I, I have, I think I'm, I'm secure. I believe that God wants two things for everyone. He wants our salvation and our sanctification. And for the salvation end of it, I see the talks on Blessed Carlo and people learning about Blessed Carlo's life can really help with their salvation, help bring them into the church, because just from his youth and how, how young he was, how newly he just lived like a few years ago, so it gives hope to parents and grandparents to share his message with their grandchildren um, or children who, who maybe aren't part of the church. He also was great for people who have doubts, who people who are thinking, you know, that's not, that's not really anything. That's just a piece of bread kind of thing. Okay, well, you know what? Look at all these miracles. And they studied them and all the, everything that he put together to help the atheists or the doubters to see the truth of the true presence. So all of Carlo, both his life and his work, can help with people's salvation. St. Manuel's different. He's really helping people for that deeper sanctification. His audience is not really the atheist. Like, I'll talk to atheists about Blessed Carlo, no problem. And my father, my father's not, my father to this day is not baptized, okay? I talk to my father about Blessed Carlo. I show him videos. I show him things about how the, the miracles change. If you can pray for my father, I would appreciate that. He's 89 and, you know, time's short. Time's short, Dad. So we're praying for his conversion, his baptism. So I will talk to an atheist about Blessed Carlo and, and, and hopefully find something that they can find of interest and, and get them to think. St. Manuel is really, his talk is more for you guys. You people who are here on a Saturday morning, you know, spend your time at a Eucharistic retreat. You're the ones who already believe. And I don't have to tell you Jesus is there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. You already know that. I'm going to guess many of you here are daily mass goers. And those who don't go to daily mass is because you have a commitment that you can't make it at that time. Right? I'm going to guess you all here pray the rosary every day. Most, if not all of you, have hours of Eucharistic adoration. If not on the schedule, at least you pop in. This is the audience that St. Manuel wants to talk to. He wants to talk about that deeper devotion. He's like, yes, I know you're, you're the choir. I'm preaching to the choir. That's who I want to talk to, to get to that next level, to be even closer. Because we're never going to be you know, there, in a sense, until we're dying in heaven, right? There's always work we, we could do until we're, until we're actually in heaven. So... He talks about external abandonment and internal abandonment. So what's external abandonment? That's when people like us who already believe don't visit Jesus enough. And I'll be the first one to say something I need to work on, right? I run a perpetual adoration chapel in my parish. I'm driving back and forth many times throughout the day, going to get my daughter from school, going to run this errand, go to the post office, drop this off. 
And how many times do I just stop in, five minutes, stop in to, to say hi to Jesus? How many days, sometimes I'm so good at filling the schedule and, I, and there's no openings that I need to go myself and I might miss a day and not go. So I mean, I'm not, not pointing any more fingers than I'm, I'm already addressing to myself. So the external abandonment, and he doesn't mean external abandonment for people who are atheists who don't know about the true, true presence. Abandonment by those who are supposed to be his friends. Internal abandonment, that's the next level, right? How many of us can show up to adoration? You might even have a whole hour. But, you know, like, and, okay, right here, not pointing any fingers, right here. I could be there, I'm like, okay, so what am I making for dinner tonight? Because i got to go to the grocery store, i got this to get done, i got this to get done, right? And in your mind, it's like, wait a minute, Jesus is right here, talk to Jesus. Your grocery list, your to-do list, your this, and that can, wait, Jesus is in front of you. Focus on him. That's the internal abandonment. That, yeah, you're physically there. You physically stopped the car, you got out, you went in. But where is your mind? Are you focusing on Christ? And it's something that we all can work on. And it's interesting, Blessed Carlo kind of talked about that a little bit. Like, that just before he died, the, the last time he went to spiritual direction before he died, he was so excited and he was telling the priest, you know, I hit this new level at adoration where I could just, like, be with Christ. I mean, I, I can't even explain. I'm not exactly sure what he meant. But he knew spiritually it was at a whole other level of how he could sit at adoration and just absorb the presence of Christ. And that was the last time he had spiritual direction before he got sick and died. So it's something that we all need to work on. And these aren't meant to be criticisms in a sense. Like I said, it's for me as well as anybody else. But these are things that we can look at. And what, plus, um, what St. Manuel is encouraging us <clears throat> to do in our, in our prayer life to get to that next level. <clears throat> so, I, Well, the tabernacle talked to him at, in Palomar's del Rio about the, yeah, will you abandon me? <laughs> but I think, I, I think that he may have had other mystical experiences. I, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly um, all how much. How, well, I mean, so when Christ talks to you, do you hear it with your ears or do you hear it with your heart? I don't know. You know, sometimes you just know things. Like Christ is telling you something, and you just know in your heart that that's from him versus are you hearing it. So talk to him. I don't know. Talk to him, right? So when he died in 1940, in 1956, there was a young woman, a young girl, maybe 17, 18, something like that. Her name was Sarita, like little Sarah, and she was very sick. She had um, some kind of, they call it tubercular appendicitis. So the tuberculosis bacteria was in her appendix. It's very rare, very deadly. She was in ex really in bad shape. She was like in a coma at this point. She was at home, and um, the doctor had come by the house, and basically told the parents, I'll come by tomorrow morning and sign the death certificate. So that's, how he, that's what he told the parents. Imagine being the parents hearing that news about your daughter, right? The parish priest came over, his name was Don Paco, and he came and he brought a handkerchief of St. Manuel. And he just, the girl's already in a coma, he just shoved it under the pillow. And the next morning, she was completely healed. Nothing, nothing wrong with her. In fact, um, she was like 17 or 18 at the time. She died in her 90s. And she was present at the Beatification Mass, was, which was in 2001. Okay, so that was the first miracle. That was the miracle for his beatification. Now, the way that miracles work is after the miracle, after the person is beatified, after, at that point, you need to have another miracle take place. So I think it was around, he was uh, beatified in 2001. I think it was around 2004 maybe 2005, in that range, um, there was a woman, Maria del Carmen, and she, had, um, she was having mouth problems, and she went to the doctor. She was already very thin and sickly, and she was at the doctor, like, yeah, that's not good. You've got cancer in your mouth, and it's, you know, bad. And so they sent her to have an appointment with the oncologist and figure out what she was going to have chemotherapy or what they could do for her. And she went home. She's obviously upset. She told her husband, can you go to the church and get the priest, ask him to come, like, you know, pray with us, maybe give me the sacrament of the sick before I start chemotherapy. I want to, you know, just have the, the prayers and the strength. The husband goes to the parish office, and the priest says, you know, I'm really busy right now. i got a lot of appointments. I can't come to your house right now. But here, take this. It's a second-class relic of, of I guess, at that time, blessed Manuel. And take this home, and you and your wife do a novena. I'll come see you later, whatever. They, had, they had didn't know who he was. They had no, who's this? This blessed Manuel. So 
But the husband, they're desperate, right? Husband takes it. They start to do the novena. On day four of the novena, she goes back, to, she goes to the oncologist, figure out what's the plan, chemo, what are we doing here? What's my chances? The oncologist examines her and he says, why are you here? There's nothing wrong with you. Okay? Interesting thing of that. I, mean, I assume, I don't know for a fact, but I would assume they finished the novena because they only got to day four, but <laughs> you would think you knew the next five days in Thanksgiving, if nothing else, right? So... The interesting point here was that priest who was too busy to go to the house and who gave them the second class relic, his name was Don Paco. He didn't just have the same name, he was actually the same priest as the one who put the handkerchief under Sarah how many years earlier? Like 40 years earlier. So it was the same priest who was involved in both of the miracles. Uh, St. Manuel was, was um, canonized on October 16th of 2016. So he's on, like I said, on the, as far as the saints go, on the newer end of the saints. So that's a little introduction to St. Manuel. I hope that you um, start to learn more about him. If nothing else, there's a book downstairs, The Bishop of the Abandoned Tabernacle. And hopefully there'll be another book that will be published soon and to start to read about him. If anyone um, speaks Spanish... We have some additional, I, didn't, I have one book in Spanish, down, I should have brought others, but there are more books. You, can, you have much greater access to his writings because they're in Spanish. I also have a little um, gift for everybody today. If, well, I'm not going to say, I say everybody, but let's see how far we get with them. If anyone's interested, I have a little uh, kit made up. It's a little plastic bag that has a few things inside. There, is, um, there are two books, the Abandoned Tabernacle book and another book that I brought back in my luggage from... Spain, because it's only printed in, in, in Europe, on St. Manuel. And I have a second-class relic and a couple of prayer cards. And if you want to borrow that for a couple of weeks or a month or so, take it home, do a novena. I have instructions on it. You can take it home, do a novena with the second-class relic. And remember, both of his miracles for canoniza- beatification and canonization were with second-class relics, so don't underestimate the second-class relic here. Um, take it home and pray with it, and then you can send it back to me. If there are instructions on there and the address is there. If I only have about, I think, nine or ten of them. So if, you, like, if you're here with a friend or relative, you maybe like one of you wants to take it first and then pass it on to the other person. And that will save you shipping, too, because like, you, know, you don't have to mail it. You could just pass it to the next person then, and then mail it back to me afterward. And then I, send it, then I go to another parish and I, I'll bring them to a different parish. Um, so if Joe has those here and um, afterward, or maybe after Mass when you venerate the relics, let me just see them and we can... Um, just take down your name, and then you can take one of those. So um, that's it about St. Manuel. I hope that, that you find that interesting and can help, help you have a little deeper devotion to Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. And I think we have Mass in about 15 minutes, and, um, and we'll be around, too. Thank you.
So I think we, we have enough time before Mass. I think we're going to do the veneration of the relic now rather than after Mass. I was going to say one other thing. On this um, first class relic of St. Manuel that I have, these are super rare. So Blessed Carlo had a lot of hair, right? He's a young kid, there's lots of hair. A lot of the relics of his first class are hair. And, you know, one little strand can go a long way, right? When St. Manuel, when they opened his tomb, there was like nothing left. There was just pretty much all dust. There was one tiny bone, and when they touched it, it just disintegrated into dust. So in order to make his relics, they're collecting all that bone dust. So the bone, people sometimes say, what is this relic? The St. Manuel relic here is bone, and it's ex these are extremely rare. There are not many of his relics in the world at all just because there wasn't much left. So that's why a lot of times our, we're going to find the miracles with him from second class relics because just there's not availability of first class relic. But we do have one here today and you can venerate that. And we also have um, Blessed Carlos relic. Oh, they're both here on the altar. Nice if we do it right.
Okay. There's a sheet on her. Yeah. I think it's a sheet. Okay.
Just want to make an announcement before Mass. Um, we're very happy to have Father Jose Maria here with us from um, uh, Griswold, the Friars of the Immaculate. Um, so we're uh, excited about him being here to guide us spiritually at Mass and in our Eucharistic Revival Retreat. Um, someone asked me this, and I thought I would just announce it in case other of you have questions. Um, as Catholics, you'll totally understand this, that um, someone asked me, Father, does this count for the weekend? Um, this Mass does not count for the weekend. Uh, so you still have to go this evening to Mass for the vigil or tomorrow. It's a votive Mass in honor of the Blessed Sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. The readings are going to be different than the readings that are at Mass, the vestments. It's not the 27th week of ordinary time. So it doesn't count uh, for your obligation for the weekend, although it counts very much uh, because it is a Mass that's being celebrated that's very important, uh, but not to fulfill your obligation for the weekend. Thanks. You would know if it did, because I would have passed a basket. If that were the case, no, I'm just kidding. We are passing a basket, but it's not for the church. Our entrance and may be found in the Heritage Missal, number 291. Please stand.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, to you, my brothers and sisters, I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, what I have done, what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, Ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, you, my brothers and sisters, pray for me to the Lord our God. The Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who accomplish the work of human redemption through the paschal mystery of your only begotten Son, graciously grant that we who confidently proclaim under sacramental signs the death and resurrection of Christ experience continued increase of your saving grace. For our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Joel. Thus says the Lord, let the nations bestir themselves and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit in judgment upon all the neighboring nations. Apply the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come and tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for great is their malice. Crowd upon crowd in the valley of decision, for near is the day of the Lord in the valley of decision. Sun and moon are darkened, and the stars will hold their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem raises his voice. The heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the children of Israel. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, am your God, dwelling on Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall pass through her no more. And then, on that day, the mountains shall drip new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the channels of Judah shall flow with water. A fountain shall issue from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a waste, and Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, because they shed innocent blood in their hand. But Judah shall abide forever, and Jerusalem for all generations. I will avenge their blood and not leave it unpunished. The Lord dwells in Zion. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. While Jesus was speaking, a woman from the crowd called out and said to him, Blessed is the womb that carried you and the breast at which you nursed. He replied, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, if someone were to ask you, give me one good reason why you believe in the most holy Eucharist. What would you tell them? Have you ever thought of that? There's many good and valid reasons why we believe in the most holy Eucharist. The first Christians believed in the Eucharist. That's a good reason. The greatest minds in the church, some of the greatest minds in history, believed in the mystery of the Most Holy Eucharist. St. Augustine, St. Thomas of Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, Benedict XVI, St. John Henry Newman, all of them believed in the Eucharist, just to name a few. That's a good reason. Many mystics have had specific Eucharistic mystical experiences. Think of Padre Pio, St. Faustina, just to name a few. That's a good reason. There are many Eucharistic miracles. Downstairs, there's a whole exhibit. That's a good reason. But if you had to boil it down to just one reason, what would you say? Here's the best reason. We believe in the most holy Eucharist because Jesus said so. We believe in the most blessed sacrament because Jesus said so, period. Jesus is God, the Son of God, truth incarnate. And God cannot deceive nor be deceived. And Jesus said so. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, he says, My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. Jesus said so. Our belief in the Most Holy Eucharist is based and entirely founded on what Jesus says. But not only. We also base our belief in the Most Holy Eucharist not only on what Jesus said, but also by what Jesus did. If you read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in St. Paul, they all tell us how our Lord instituted the Eucharist. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he took cup, and he said, this is my body. This is my blood. Words by which he institutes the most holy Eucharist. He is really, truly, substantially present in the Blessed Sacrament. This is what our Lord did. But now here, here's the most important thing, though. Notice that after he institutes the most Blessed Sacrament, he also institutes the sacred priesthood. He says, do this in memory of me. 
words by which he institutes the sacrament of holy orders. Do you see what our Lord is doing there, brothers and sisters? That's a very important move because he wills to be really, truly present in the most blessed sacrament. And he also wills that that be perpetuated in time. So important. Why is that important? He wants to perpetuate that mystery in time. Because we, when he institutes the most holy Eucharist, he had you in mind. He wills to be really, truly present in the most holy Eucharist in time to be, to be present in your life. Oh my goodness. What an absolute gift. This is the source and summit of Christian life. This is the mystery of faith. Here and now, our Lord is really present in the Blessed Sacrament. This was his idea. He wanted to perpetuate it in time to be present in your life for you. Oh my goodness, this is too good to be true. But the good news is, it is true. And the fact that he is really, truly, substantially present in the Blessed Sacrament means that the offenses, the blasphemies, need reparation. I will never forget, when I was still a seminarian in North Italy, I remember in one town, in particular, were advertising, they were advertising a black mass that was going to happen during the week. Posters everywhere. I will never forget that. And despite the protests of the Catholics, the Satanists continued their black masses. After that week, literally, an earthquake hit that town. I'll never forget it. I was in my cell, I was in my room, and the room started to shake. This is not normal. Woke up, humongous crack on the wall. An earthquake hit that town. The offenses, the blasphemies, they need reparation, you see. Our Lord is there for you. If you want to really and truly deepen your faith, you need to visit, pray, be present, receive our Lord in the most blessed sacrament. He is there. There he speaks, not in words, but through his graces. All of us have problems. Bring it to Jesus. All of us need something. Bring it to Jesus. All of us have worries. What's going to happen in the future? Who knows? Talk to our Lord. He will give you interior peace. He will give you interior strength. That's how he speaks. He speaks by affecting the effects. Lord, Help me to trust. If you really, sincerely open your heart to him in the Blessed Sacrament, you will see that he will speak by affecting the effects. You will have more interior trust in his divine providence. I promise you, if you go to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, like the people in the Gospels go to him, your life will change. But nobody can do that for you, you see. The spiritual life cannot be automated. You have to be intentional about it. It's personal. It's a cor ad cor loquitur. It's a heart that speaks to the heart, the most sacred heart of Jesus that continues to beat in the most blessed sacrament. Brothers and sisters, let me end by saying this. 
Yesterday we celebrated October 13, Our Lady of Fatima. In all of her approved apparitions, Guadalupe, Lourdes, Fatima, Our Lady always, always, always asks for something very specific. Many people lose or don't notice this particular detail. They always say, prayer and penance, yes. Daily rosary, yes. But she also asks for very, something very, very specific. And at Fatima, it was on October 13th, 1917, when she asked this specific request. She asked for a chapel to be built. Why is that? Because where the chapel is, the most blessed sacrament is. The Blessed Virgin Mary always leads us to her Son, present in the most blessed sacrament. Let us pray to Our Lady that there be a real and true Eucharistic revival especially in this parish. But the Eucharistic revival happens in your heart, in your life, in your practice of the faith. That revival happens within when we really, truly make the Blessed Sacrament the center, the source, and the summit of our life. We entrust all these intentions to the Blessed Mother. May she lead us to her Son, really, truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. And may the Blessed Sacrament be really, truly the center of our lives. Brothers and sisters, we entrust our intentions to our Heavenly Father. That the Holy Father, Pope Francis, all bishops and all pastors be led by the Holy Spirit and lead the church closer to the heavenly home and for unity and renewal in the church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a greater love and respect of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Through the intercession of Saint Manuel Gonzalez Garcia, we ask for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to move the hearts of the people to a greater love of Eucharistic adoration. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are suffering, the poor, hungry, war-torn, and forgotten immigrants, and those who are homeless, those who are prisoners of addiction and all who are afraid. May we find ways to provide healing and hope. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Through the powerful intercession of Blessed Carlo Acutis, we ask you, Father, for a spiritual revival of all young people to a greater fervor and love of the sacramental life of the church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that our parish will grow in holiness through deeper devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Rosary. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the intentions we hold that remain in the quietness of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us turn now to the Virgin Mary imploring peace for our world as we pray. Hail Mary. Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. 
O God, our refuge and our strength, hear the prayers of your church, for you yourself are the source of all devotion. And grant, we pray, that what we ask in faith we may truly obtain, through Christ our Lord. may be found in St. Michael's, number 636.
You make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your life, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, your, your spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence, we rely from failing heart. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation we pray, Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope, and Richard our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people who have gained your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom we have suffered before you. In your compassion and merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Lord, departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind and sincere kingdom that we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, who we be so the world, all that we say.
that the heavenly table sanctifies the Lord we pray, so that through the body and blood of Christ, the whole family of believers may be bound together. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And your spirit. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Well, this um, really is beautiful how it concludes with Mass, our um, tremendous Eucharistic um, revival retreat, um, focusing on these two great saints. Um, we really thank, again, uh, Father Jose Maria for coming and Father Fleming coming for, for, for last night. I want to thank Emery Kennedy for her tremendous work and her crew um, so beautifully putting it all together. I want to announce that we're, we're very honored in our diocese. There are two parishes uh, in November that are going to have the relic of the arm of St. Jude. And he's coming here. They very rarely release him from Rome, the, the, the relic. And Father Carlos Martins, remember he came and had hundreds of relics downstairs in our parish hall. He called me and he said, you know, Father, I really, I really love your parish. I loved your facility. Um, I'm only asking two parishes of, of your diocese, um, but would you be one of them? Because he's going to be traveling with this all over the world. So I told them it would be tremendous to have uh, the arm of St. Jude. I think our Eileen's parish is going to have the arm of St. Jude, too, in Massachusetts. So um, he asked me if I knew of any other parish, and I said, well, my home parish in Providence, uh, St. Augustine's, uh, Father Mahar just became the pastor there, and, um, and they have a big church and a big parking lot, beautiful facility. It's in the northern part of the state in Providence. So uh, he's, they're going to go there, too, uh, in the arm of St. Jude. Then we'll be in two uh, places, uh, two parishes in our diocese. And that, for us, it'll be um, Friday, November 11th, I think it is. Is it the 10th? 11, uh, November 10th. So um, I'm going to ask Mary, uh, Anne Marie if we can keep these signs, because they're great that she made these signs. And we'll have a committee together to, to put this together too. Eileen is very excited about the arm of St. Jude coming. We have a devotion to St. Jude in our, in our cry room where we have a novena uh, to him for people who want to say the novena. So we know how powerful his prayers are and how powerful it will be uh, to have him here as well as, as his relics are here, as well as we're so grateful to God that these relics are here for us today and that we could focus on this, on the Eucharist today. The, the um, uh, um, display will be downstairs immediately after Mass. Uh, please go downstairs and enjoy that. I was kidding about, um, oh, it's not, it's ended? Okay, it's ended. All right, so it's not happening. We'll have veneration quickly after Mass, but the display is going to be broken down. Okay, so veneration after Mass, but the display won't be there. But you've had a chance to see the display. And then again, I want to thank Eileen for coming and uh, all of you for participating in this very, very beautiful and special event. And I was kidding about the collection. It's not for the parish, um, uh, but it's, it's for Eileen and her work and the beautiful mission that they do in Thanksgiving for them. So thank you for your generosity as the pastor of the parish and as a pastor, thank you. For, for everybody. Carla, too. I didn't want to mention everyone's name because then I would have to mention everyone's name. I just said you and your crew. But Carla certainly uh, should be mentioned as well. But then I want to mention everyone else, too, who really, really helped put this together and were uh, the crew for both of them. So God bless you today. Thank you, Father. Our recessional hymn may be found in the Heritage Missal, number 325.